Okay, how, what are you guys talking about? I'm curious how you're hanging with all this stuff now that we've uh, had some time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we do too much of that in the group, but I think we don't digest it quite well. I think we cannot see the parallels between the two and um, how they can be complementary in taking an approach. And we were just talking then about maybe if you apply the different, say, ways of thinking and perspectives, the context of the situation might actually end up with the same outcome, even though there's different approaches. So there's some power in the context to, to what you're looking at. Yeah, the, the, the interesting part, and this, this where, so the contextual part, I think, is pretty well understood from Pepper and in the West, um, except the, tie, the idea of um, the strands of time and tying those together. And so uh, when Mike Jackson says that Marilyn Emery doesn't get it, it's because she, she when she worked with Fred, was primarily socio-technical systems. So inside an organization, um, I hate to say that you know she's very um, uh, Western um, uh, unionist in the way that she thinks about job organization. Um, that's not necessarily the way the world is. So if you think about uh, software development and you know um, the way that developers move around companies and the open source movement and all that sort of stuff, that's all social ecological in the sense of you have a developer join Google and then they go over to uh, you know, to Apple, and they move around, and they do all these sorts of things. That's all socio-ecological. You have someone, you go, oh, yeah, you work with all these companies. Or the joke is you have to fail at three startups before you can actually be legitimate in the Silicon Valley. So you have that thread of all those things moving together. Um, so the contextual is well understood. The twist and the harder part is the dyadic. And that, that's the part where you have to stop and think about, um, and it's, it's simple, it's like, you know, so you're going to go running, go jogging, and then afterwards it's like, oh, you're going to be tired. And it's like, okay, there's that idea of diachrony, which is it's okay to do something for a period of time, but then you have to change. And so um, the, this is where the idea is. So if you actually think about this hard, this idea of hastening or retarding. So is there a natural change that's going to happen anyway? Uh, working in the, um, uh, in the public sector, as an example, you know when election is coming? It's like, you're going to do, try to do anything in the civil service when election is just about to happen? It's like, no, they're not going to talk to you at all because there's no point, right? There's a rhythm. Or in the public sector, uh, I don't know how it is here, but the budgets close at the end of March. Fiscal year is at the end of March. And so you have to work on the whole cycle of the year according to what they do. You know, Christmas comes and they don't work, and then you know, New Year comes and it's still starting up. These sorts of things happen. Um, and so the question of hastening or slowing down is like catching those opportunities where it's kind of like, okay, if there's a new government that's just come into place, then strike while the iron is hot. And you say, but this was a good idea. It's, a, oh, it's only a good idea when the government was going to adopt it and they're looking for new ideas. After the government's come in, it's like, you know, a year later, it's like, no, you're too late. It's all about the timing. So... A lot, of, a lot of us are thinking, I find that, that that's a major thing I think about, which is now the timing of things and when you might or might not do things because it doesn't make sense anymore. But in terms of the timing, sometimes there is an advantage and a necessity for very regular timing and knowing that, for instance, if you're playing a certain type of music, you come in on two and the four, whereas if you're playing, say, reggae music, you're coming on off the two and the four. Yeah. But you're still using the two and the four as a structure within it. Mm -hmm. Whereas within jazz, part of free form jazz, is that the structure changes. And it doesn't necessarily do it naturally. Mm -hmm. Because actually somebody somewhere is going to make the change that is going to lead to it. And then somebody's going to interpret it. So it doesn't necessarily happen through just it happening. Actually, there is always something that instigates the change, even if it's going to be changing in time signature within playing jazz, because actually the keyboardist might suddenly do something that then triggers something. So there's always an input or output that actually will impact on the rhythm, as opposed to it just sort of taking place through some sort of natural, no stimulus approach. Yeah. So you're reading out the differentiation between when we talk about uh, rhythm, rhythm and then rhythmic shift. So most rhythm people are okay with is the rhythmic shifts that they have problems with. 
and and that's why in order in, separating them is quite difficult. And so um, the way that we run workshops often is a question. The question we actually ask is, um, what rhythmic shift is most present to you? What's top of mind? Uh, and it could be because something is happening that you don't want to happen, or something is happening that you, that you do want to happen, but it's happening too slowly. That's generally what happens. Um, but the, the idea of the shift is and trying to separate out that. Because when people think about rhythm, they think, oh, it's normal. But no, no, there are shifts in rhythm. And so when you talk about free jazz, it's like they start changing time signatures. It's like, oh, that's going to be a big shift. But there is a stimulation, and that is the interesting part within the systems for me. It's actually where does that stimulation occur? And it can be unintentional, but it can be intentional. Yes. And it's interesting is when you start to try and analyze it and work out where that's coming from, you start to look at the boundaries to impact it. Because actually, if you wanted to take, like elections, actually, if you take the election out of the count, uh, government organization, which you can do by setting the boundaries, and it becomes about ebbs and flows, and stops and flows, effectively. But actually, you can, you do know that there is a pattern where it's actually, the pattern's not going to change, but the speed of it will change due to outside stimuli. Yeah. Good. Any other comments? John Cale did some work ages ago on a thing called jamming. Jamming, yeah. Similar yeah. to what we're talking about here. Yeah. I, I, like, again, this is where uh, synchrony, they tend to talk more about synchrony than diachrony. Yeah, yeah. And, and so reading the Chinese philosophy, um, going back to um, um, the translations of, uh, of the Tao Te Ching and the original, uh, sorry, the Yi Jing, the Book of Changes, the, the, the first um, a significant work was done by Richard Wilhelm, who was a German missionary. Um, and, and so if you actually look up the Book of Changes, Yi Ching, the standard one is actually that one German text. And Carl Jung wrote the introduction to it. And supposedly that's where he got the idea of synchronicity. Yeah. That's a misreading. We're talking about diachrony, not synchronicity. So Jung misread and published something that is misleading. So it's true. Yeah. Can I just ask, we've got a question on line. You referenced an also on the topic of too much body heat in winter being okay. But too much heat in the summer can be fatal. Who was that? Uh, Peacock Lee. So, the philosophical foundations of classical Chinese medicine. Philosophical foundations of classical Chinese medicine. Right. An accurate title, but hard. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. So we covered philosophizing, theorizing, and we should be the home run with working on practicing. So how do we change practicing? How do we resequence system thinking? So the first thing is to change from the idea of unfreezing, refreezing, to contextual action learning. I'll give you some history of that. The second is to change from intention to attention. And the third is to shift from adaptive problem solving into learning better questions. And we'll have a... Uh, Exercise on bias for action, which is Yo Wei, and doing no harm, which is uh, Wu Wei. So, change of three steps is pretty standard in the uh, organization literature. The challenge with change of three steps that was attributed to uh, Kurt Levine, Kurt Lewin, uh, is that um, it was a post hoc reconstruction. Lewin actually never wrote that. And so, the idea about changes three steps, unfreeze, change, refreeze, is like, okay, well, how did this come about? And it came because they're trying to simplify the ideas of change. But the idea of unfreezing is a Western philosophical sort of thing because you're talking about solids and the ability to unfreeze. If we actually bypass that and go to processes instead, it's like, okay, we're not even in the same ballpark. Now, this really interesting book, I wonder if you have it in your library here. Um, this is written, it's Learning Works, um, Search for Organizational Futures. It's a tribute to Eric Christ, edited by Susan Wright and David Morley. We're at York University in Toronto. Um, unfortunately, everyone here, I hate to say, is dead. Uh, so you have to get it in, in uh, hindsight. 
Well, what happened was there was an action learning group at York University in Toronto when Eric Trist was visiting in 1977-1985, and there's an opportunity here to actually learn from it because when people talk about uh, about Emory and Trist, they don't look at this part of, of what he was doing. Um, so we, we had that Emory and Trist created the typology of environmental types, then we have that was a causal texture paper. Uh, and the environmental turbulence, definitely part of the causal textures paper. But then he came with the idea of adopting a negotiated order based off collaboration rather than competition and turbulent sense. And this is where he term organization ecology. And so this is where they start getting into more of the socio-ecological uh, perspective and, and where it actually takes place. Now the change that happens, has everyone done here action, action research methods? Hands up. Who knows about action research? Oh, okay. Brief review on action research. Okay, so action research is a way of engaging in systems changes. Um, start off with diagnosing the problem, uh, you do action planning, considering the alternative course of action. The interesting thing about doing action planning is uh, when you're doing action research and working with a client, when, you, when they're gonna make a major decision about direction, this is the point at which you record all the decisions and all those paths that they didn't take. So if you, if you could've gone on path A, B, or C, why did you choose D? Why didn't you choose A and B and C? Because you can't, you can't after you actually go back and reconstruct them after the fact. You need to do it at that point, which is there's an assumption made about what's happening in the world and you actually want to say, I have written down that time, and that's where the action learning comes in. You took that action because you thought this was going to happen. You take the action, you evaluate, you have the learning now, and the learning now comes back and says, okay, well, would we even be better to have taken path A, B, or C rather than path D when we're going forward? Action research uh, is a different uh, approach uh, alternative to positive science, it's future oriented, applied system development, near grounded actions, agnostic and situational. So this is at the foundations of, uh, of the work that is common from the Tavistock um, Institute for Human Relations. And so action research with a lot of what uh, Emory and Trist have done. There's a difference between action research, I won't go into all the details here, the difference between action research that you typically see at a university where you have the facilitator outside of the decision-making group, and action learning, which focuses on people that are in the group. So it's more like participatory action research, uh, but the idea is that you have the uh, insider and outsider roles uh, that are blended together. And from this, this, this is how we created um, the action learning cycle that happens with the uh, system changes learning circle. So this is actually the method that we've done. We've used this, um, piloted this with uh, Code for Canada. So on my website, you can actually go and find this and, and get the full description of it. Uh, but we center on this idea of hub and force both. So this is the hub, knowing from within. So the first thing you have to do is identify the system of interest. It's pretty obvious for systems people, uh, because the idea is if there are systems change, it happens from inside the system. You don't change from outside the system. You, there may be influences outside the system that would cause you to do that, which raises the first question, what are the contextual influences that change your going from within? Okay, so now these, if, you, if you've had the idea of threads, this is the thread you're on. These are the threads outside that are influencing you. And you have the weave, and it could be that that weave is too tight, it's too loose, you're hanging out like a single thread in the, in the weave but you're not fitting in, so that's causing some discomfort in you internally as a system. Second one, diagnosing arrhythmic disorders. Now we have the idea of the way that we approach this because we approach it like Chinese medicine. So we're actually looking at yin-yang. Now what's an easy way of discussing yin-yang in an organization in the commercial sense, a realistic sense? Well, marketing is yin, production is yang. Marketing is like immaterial, and production is material. So there's a balance that happens there. So I, I've asked the question, you know, is 
how how is your yin relative to your yang? Like, are you overselling or are you overproducing or underselling or overproducing? And so people understand that when you frame it that way, and it's like, well, you can't just keep selling stuff and not producing anything. You, you have balance between the two. So there's disorder that happens there. We have prognosing likelihoods. Um, prognosing turns out to be something that in the medical profession, when they're working through, it's not done enough. Prognosis is the alternative ways of treating the illness or the ailment. <coughs> so you, you, you got the problem, you figured out what's happened with the yin and yang out of balance. In Chinese medicine, it would be, okay, well, you could approach this either with herbs or with acupuncture or with cupping. Uh, you know, what, what would you do? And you go, well, you know, if you take herbs, you have to take them like, you know, every day. Is that good for you? Do you want acupuncture, which is immediate relief? Uh, you know, all these sort of things. So it's alternative ways of doing it. So Western medicine is, do you use medications? Do you do surgery? Uh, do you, you have orthotics or, or, or prosthetics? These sort of things are ways of adjusting. So there's different ways of doing it. But the, the trick behind the uh, prognosing is, what is not only what is likely to uh, to remedy the uh, ailment, but what is also um, likely to happen? Uh, what is likely to be adopted by the system? So um, when I turned sixty, I went to uh, my family doctor, and she said, "Oh, you know, your cholesterol is high, your blood pressure is high. Uh, we have a program upstairs, the Jenkins Portfolio Diet. Um, you want to try that?" And so the Jenkins portfolio diet is going vegan. Um, so within three weeks, going vegan reduced my cholesterol problem. Great. Why doesn't everybody do it? Well, the major issue with the Jenkins portfolio diet is only 30% of the people can maintain it after a year. Going vegan. So you know, for anyone here that has cholesterol issues, I have a solution for you. But it means going vegan. <laughs> and it's like really going vegan. Uh, so when we're prognosing likelihoods here, the question about whether people would stick with a vegan diet comes as part of it. That'd be one of the treatments. The other alternative would be take medication for the cholesterol problem. Oops, wrong button. And the last one is reordering pacing. And this is now speeding up or slowing down parts of the rhythms that are there. And there are multiple rhythms at play now. And so the question would be, what rhythms do you want to have speed up, and what rhythms do you not want to have slow down? The people that say you should accelerate everything and do everything faster, it's like, no, that doesn't work. You know, a system that's going to cause a breakdown. You can, have, you can speed up some things, but you have to slow down something else. I've also been modeling this in optic process methodology, so um, some details here on, on the physical... Um, so optic process methodology comes out of the uh, systems engineering community. It's a great way of modeling because uh, it separates out processes from objects. Um, and when you actually have something constructed, you can actually see that processes are different, information and physical things. Okay, the infree unfreezing, refreezing mindset. Um, you have this idea in the Western philosophy of models in the mind. Uh, where you have this essence of truth. And so the question of extracting out the best way of doing something is the way that we would do, uh, diagnose or normally go through an unfreeze, change, freeze sort of thing. You're abstracting from that. The alternative is to, in the Chinese philosophy, is to look for favorable conditions to support a situation ripening to maturity. Here we have a banana. A banana obviously goes ripe and then it goes dark. Um, so there is a good time and a bad time. There's timing that's important in trying to do the, the uh, try to meet the propensity and the likelihood of things actually happening the way you want them to happen. So timing comes in bigger here. I'm going to switch now to attention, intention versus intention. Um, this relates also to a lot of Tim Ingold's work where you have the idea of intention of a journey to travel from one place to another. So here we have a bicyclist on a path, um, and they're going pretty fast, and they're coming out, but it's getting from one place to another. That is an intention-oriented journey. 
attention refocuses on the ground surroundings that uh, as we wayfare. And so when we talk about attention, in the case of being in a crowd, you're just trying to not run into other people. You're trying to not uh, trip and fall. Um, and the question is, are you spending more time on attention or are you spending more time on intention, on setting the goals and setting the ends? So what we do in system changes learning is we tend to emphasize the attention. What is it that is actually the pain point, if you want to put it that way, or discomfort that you have in your current system that we would adjust? So it follows that medical sort of mentality where the system is operating normally and then you have something that causes you to actually decide you want a systems change. In balancing the ideas of attention, um, you have the idea of well, Eisenhower said, the urgent are never important and the important are never urgent. And so when the phone rings, do you really have to answer the phone? Like, is that urgent or is that important? Usually it's an urgency that is imposed by somebody else. Uh, is it possible that there's something important, like uh, a dam that needs to be fixed, but it's not urgent and you should fix it sometime? So we found this two by two matrix helpful in trying to describe the multiple contextual changes. We have urgent, important, and local and distant. When people say there's a change, like, well, okay, let's talk about this. So let's talk about a medical example. So local and urgent, if you're on the battlefield, calling a medic on the battlefield is local and urgent. Someone is dying and they, they're, they're injured so much that you need to deal with them actually at the time that they're on the field. If you can get it to go to local and important, you would have a medical clinic. You could schedule things locally. You don't need to be deal, dealt with at that moment. You could deal with it later. Um, go the other direction, distant and urgent, you have a trauma center. So you don't deal with people in on the field. You take them to a specialized trauma center where things get handled, multiple injuries. We also have the case of important and distant which is organizing an operating room team. In this case, it, it doesn't have to be, uh, it's important to have a surgery, but you don't necessarily have to do it at the moment. Um, you can do it, uh, sorry, you don't have to do it uh, at the place, you can do it uh, in the, a location of your choosing. So what does it mean to have this idea of local or distant? Um, when we talk about local and doing systems change, local we mean in direct interaction, that people can actually um, have a direct influence on the outcome. You, you actually can, you're actually involved, as opposed to um, distant through representation of locality. Now what happens here is you've got all these cameras as an example. Is, is people are watching what's happening. This is actually a joint chief of staffs, I believe. Um, they, but the question is, can you actually influence that? And it's like, well, no, that's actually distant. You may know someone who knows someone who knows someone that can make have, have an influence, or might have an influence. That's not a local connection. So thinking about systems, when people say that everything is connected to everything else, I go, well, not really. We're now taking the idea of space and we're trying to build that out because there are some things that are directly connected that you could actually make systems change directly, but quite often it's distant. If it is distant, can you actually shorten the distance and connect yourself more closely with the person with influence? This would be the equivalent when I was talking in time about um, hastening or retarding, because you can speed things up, you can slow things down, or, and in this case, in space, you can bring people closer or you can bring people more distant um, in your interaction. I'm going to close with this last, with the, this last idea about adaptive problem solving versus learning better questions. So there's a difference between adapting and learning. I'm going to use ACOF's definition here. 
Um, to adapt is to respond to an internal external change in such a way to maintain or improve conformance. You can either change the system or the change as environment. So a copy is an example. If it gets cold, you can take off your sweater uh, or you can change the heat. Um, if, you, if you're actually putting on, on clothing, you're changing yourself. If you put on the heat, you're changing the environment. Now, learning is different from adapting um, then because ACOF is goal-oriented still, he's still teleological, he sees that improving performance under unchanging conditions. Um, and ex experience is controlled as experimentation, as uncontrolled or trial and error, but talks about um, learning as being separate from adapting. We're going to take a different look at this and come through Bateson. And Bateson had categories of learning, uh, and he did this with uh, at training dolphins. And so we start about proto-learning. Uh, proto-learning, the, the, well, let's start off with the dolphins. So the, the dolphins, the simplest one is you have a dolphin, and you want the dolphin to do a trick, and the dolphin does no trick. That is zero learning. Proto-learning, or learning one, is you got a dolphin, you teach it a trick, you give it a reward. It does a trick, you do a reward. Okay, so doing the same thing over and over again, that is a change in response to correcting errors within a set of alternatives. Um, if we do this in terms of food service handling, cafeteria kitchens are trying to get consistency and safety. They try not to kill anybody. So you actually want proto-learning at a certain level. You don't want errors at that point. That's, this is one level of learning. Deuteral learning, learning two, the question that, that uh, Bateson asked was, can you get the dolphins to, be, to recognize that they're being rewarded for learning something new, not doing the same thing over and over again? They could do the trick once and then repeat that trick, but can they actually do more than that? And so what uh, Bateson did was, at first, it was get, reward them for proto learning, but then the dolphin does a trick and you don't give it a reward. And it's like, okay, then the dolphin thinks, oh, it must be an error. So he goes, does the trick again, the same trick again, and no reward. And the dolphin gets angry and acts out and just dumps out of the water. You give it a reward. The dolphin will actually learn that it's being rewarded for new tricks, not the same trick over and over again. That's dual learning. Changing the response, correcting the set of alternatives. So you're broadening the number of responses acceptable. Um, the example that we could use in, uh, in cooking is mastering a range of food prep traditions. So you go to the Culinary Institute of America, you learn French cooking, you learn Italian cooking, you learn Chinese cooking. Um, they're all different styles and being able to switch among them. The third level, the trial learning, is the one that we've had a mystery about, about whether you can actually get people to actually think beyond the deuteral learning. In this case, it would be taking the dolphin out of the tank and putting them into the ocean. That's a totally different environment. And we've had this question for some time, and so I actually personally now have figured out a way of doing it. Um, so my wife and I have four sons. And I started with my son, Adam, playing a year of badminton. And the question was, when you graduate from high school, how about going to China for two years? And, you, you know, go to university in China. We don't care about the grades. You're going to either learn Chinese or you're not going to learn Chinese when you're there. But for two years, then you come back to university in Canada. <coughs> and first it was like, why would I do that? And then it's like, oh, okay. Then it's like, yeah, we do that. So my son went, uh, went to uh, Redmond University in Beijing. Had a good time. My second son went. My third son went. My fourth son went. So my wife and I speak English at home. We don't speak Chinese. Um, and uh, my sons came back all fluent in Mandarin. They kept it up very well. But they're not, they're, they, they can read and they, they, they get along. So um, there's a case where it was learning about the change of environment. So I started off and I said, okay, there's two things I'm going to give you. Um, uh, one, one, we have to give you enough money to get started. But... What I want you to do, I'm going to give you a compass on a keychain. And so I always travel with the compass on a keychain because it turns out that when you actually, I learned this actually from Yoshi, when I was on the systems community. The first, the first time I experienced the, the, the compass question was we went bicycling in Munich. And when you get to the main station in Munich, you know there's 13 exits to the Munich train station. And it's like, which, which, which direction am I going? So a compass actually helps you. Um, but, uh, um, the, the first thing was, oh, get go uh, when you get to Beijing, uh, get a mobile phone so we have a number so we can call you and call us. That's easy. The second thing is open a bank account. Now, 
in Canada, the banking system works really, really well. Like, you go in, you can open an account in like, you know, less than an hour. <coughs> if you go to Beijing and try to open a bank account, you better plan on at least half a day. Because it's like, oh, it's like, how does it happen that they have so many rules and regulations and these sort of things? So that's their first experience. They start recognizing that things are different in a different country and the behaviors work differently. My sons came back um, through the sisters community and got invitations to go to Japan. So I took two of my sons uh, to Tokyo uh, with uh, Jim Kojima's funding. Uh, that was nice. Uh, and um, the first thing is they get, to, they get to Tokyo and they go, oh, it's going to be like China. It's like they get there, they go, oh, no. Tokyo is nothing like Beijing, but it's okay. They can get along. Like it's the writing, there's some of it they can recognize something in Chinese, in Chinese script. But very quickly they come to adapt into different cultures, and so they're used to traveling. That is tribal learning. Can you take someone? This is what I call the James Bond test. The old James Bond was the guy that had the gadgets and no one else had them. When Daniel Craig became James Bond, you have to watch the movie carefully because. He no longer had the gadgets. All the enemies had the gadgets. James Bond, under Daniel Craig, was a person that could make it on his own. That's tritone learning. So, in the world, we think that people can be proto learning, can be doodle learning. We're working and actually within CSRP Institute, most of the research I've done, trying to get people into that trito learning mode. And when I say trito learning, it's not just cognitive learning, it's actually internal in your whole system, can you actually embody and feel in that different way and understand how different cultures and different ways work? Now, coming back to the rational world, um, we see this idea of theory of change. I don't know if you've seen these ideas of theory of change. Uh, and they often happen in the system changes world, and they ask, what system, what's your theory of change? It turns out this comes a lot from uh, the uh, Kellogg Foundation, but the idea is primarily around the theory of change committing the donor to a set of class of giving targets. So what they are looking for is philanthropic inputs, activities, outputs, outcomes. And so this is very goal-oriented in the way they do theory of change. It's also complemented in the bigger picture about theories of leverage about what impact you can make in the world, that's primarily for the funders, and a theory of scale that guides the philanthropic work. So after they do the theory of change, they have a theory of scale. I really dislike this. Because then what happens when people start off projects, they start off with the idea of, what we're gonna do is have a pilot project on a small group of people, and I'm gonna make it work, and then we're gonna scale up. And the idea of scaling up, are you even in the same system, or is that a different system? So I'm definitely not in favor of this, and um, we have more on the way that they approach it with the conceptual approach, outcome approach, activities approach. But the idea of theory of change is something, if you haven't seen it before, it may come up against again. And I, I challenge you to challenge the person that says what your theory of change is, actually, what is your theory? It's like, what? No, what is your theory? So how are you actually going to introduce change into a system? Well, we'll start off and do a pilot project that will scale up and they go, yeah, but I don't think that necessarily is going to work. How about if we approach it differently? This brings us to the question of systematic change versus systemic change. When you have an error in a system, it's actually possible, more possible, to have a systematic, a systematic change, which is um, uh, an orderly sequence of activities or steps or phases, has a logic to it, as opposed to a systemic change, which is creative, disciplined, decision-oriented, not linear, sequential, has all these feedback and reflection cycles, these sort of things happening. So systemic change and systematic change are not the same thing. And it's fine if you're actually clear about which one you want. For funders, funders tend to want systemic, systematic change because they want to see, they want to know the outcome before you start. So they're very goal-oriented. But if you're looking at systemic change, it might be a different thing, which is something you can't control. It's like going vegan. So a step, going vegan is a systemic change. It's not systemic just because it's changing the way I eat. Uh, I used to be the cook of the family. So my wife, fortunately, stepped out. My wife is now the unfortunate recipient of being married to a vegan. That is a big impact. That's systemic. 
you make the differentiation between reformation and transformation. Reformation is a moderate change of behavior without changing the structure of function. You can do the kinds of things always been done before, you do some differently. Transformation, radical change of structure of function, often response to change environment. There's some risk involved, and there may be a short-term sacrifice for long-term gains. And so when people say they want systems change, are they really willing to have a real transformation? Are they willing to have uh, one, one, one person, uh, uh, the, uh, one executive I met was quite interesting. He said he was brought in to be a change agent into the oil company. And he said, okay, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to have a five-year timeline. And after five years, I'm out. And then your first year goes by, says, I have four years, I'm reporting that you guys haven't made the change. Another year goes by and says, I'm now three years from, from ending my tenure at this company. You guys have not made a change yet. Do you want to make a change or not make a change? And he was so for systemic change that he was doing himself out of a job. Are you willing to do a systemic change that would do yourself out of a job? There's a question. And we have complicatedness, elaborate the structure, versus complexity. Now, complexity is built into a system. Complicatedness this means you can take things apart, you may be able to track them piecemeal. But a complex system is all wrapped up together. Um, when you when you try to if you're trying to change a complex system, one of the ways of, of looking at this would be changing the rhythms, as opposed to looking at it structurally and changing a, a complicated structure is, is easier to look at in a structural sense. But if you're actually looking for a, a, a change of a complex structure, you might look at it instead in terms of rhythm and and whether you can accelerate or decelerate something in the system. Uh, let's skip over that. Um, now, switching to the idea of learning better questions, um, Ian Mitroff has this idea of four types of errors that's interesting. And, and, uh, uh, but he starts off with this quote from Thomas Pidgeon, if they can get you asking the wrong questions, they don't have to worry about the answers. So there's four types of errors that we have, two of which are really well known. There's the type one error a false positive, um, and usually uh, Ian talks about this in terms of drug testing. So you're going to test a drug, and the question is, does this drug work or not work? And so a false positive would be, the tests say the drug works, but it doesn't. It doesn't actually work. But the tests say it does. That would be a type 1 error. A type 2 error is a false negative. So what happens is it says the drug doesn't work, but it actually does work. That's another type of error. The type 3 error is tricking ourselves. The unintentional error of solving the wrong problem precisely through ignorance, faulty education, unreflective practice. If you're looking at drugs now, it would be so they give you a placebo and it, and it cures you. And you think, oh, I took this drug and it actually solved the problem. And you go, I gave you placebo. The drug did nothing. I was just giving you sugar tablets. That's tricking ourselves. Tricking ourselves intensely error of solving the wrong problems through mouse ideology, zealousness, self-righteous or wrongdoing. This is the problem we're actually running into now with misinformation. People actually causing you to have the wrong, doing the wrong thing for the wrong reasons. Um, so in, in, trying to, in trying to get into this idea, the question and what we work with in philosophy the approach that we take with the system changes learning is not to look for solutions. What we are looking to do is have you think about better questions. And when we're talking about better questions, what do we mean by better questions? We're trying to get into ones that will help people think about the questions without going through these types of errors, without trying to, um, in effect, create a test for you that has a solution. The pursuit is actually to try to get you thinking about a different sense. Okay, so in recording, in recording the priorities, um, what we want to do is, is talk about five types of learning. And we want to cover this. Now, this maps into the uh, hub and four spokes I've done before, but not one on one. So, these are things that we use to monitor the way that we're looking at the world. So, learning which, learning what, learning why, learning whom, when, and where, and then learning how. Now, let me get into more detail what we knew. 
So the first question is, learning which shifts matter. So we were talking before about rhythm and how rhythms are kind of regular. But the rhythmic shifts are what matter. And when we talk to people, it's like, is it that a rhythmic shift is not happening or rhythmic shift you want is happening? So, it, it, so it's either a negative or a positive sort of thing that the rhythmic shift is or is not happening. The second one is learning what rhythmic disorders prevail, because just because a rhythm changes doesn't mean that it's actually a problem for you. You could handle that rhythmic shift, it's not a problem, but there are some that are different and some of the disorder associated with that. Again, the prognosis, learning why the prognosis is preferred. Um, again, this is this again closely related to the prognosis about why you choose one way or the other. In the pacing, learning who, when, and where the resets are valued or disfavored. And finally, learning how and making things go into everyday practice. So these actually map into artifacts. We start working on methodologies um, and stepping through them. We start off with um, the system changes of interest, the system correlates of influence, the concerns associated with, 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 with the rhythmic disorders, the entailments that are associated with the prognosis, and then the appreciations that happen um, in the whom, when, and where. So you're not going to make the change necessarily with everyone, but it's going to be contextual. And the final one is learning how to change. And this is a sub-world where you may not change all of the system. You may change parts of the system that, are, that, that have the predisposition to change at that time. The way this happens is we work through uh, the language action perspective. Um, does anyone here know the language action perspective? Okay, so this is um, this comes from um, Fernando Flores, an Ontario Winnow grad, and the idea of the conversation for action. Originally, this research was for um, this research was for uh, the question about what can you do with computers and what can't you do with computers. Uh, but the way that we think about language action perspective is it's more or less like buying or selling a house. We make a commitment. You start off with a request, you know, can I buy your house? Um, and you go through, could be, you get a rejection, say, no, I don't want to sell my house, or I, I didn't really want to, you, you, you can withdraw. I didn't really want that house after all. Or you can say, well, maybe, you know, the counter going back and forth. But at a certain point, you may have a promise. And the promise says, yes, I will sell you the house. Um, after that, um, there's going to be the closing of the house. Um, before the closing happens, you can have a renege or the withdrawal or the cancellation. But if everything goes well, you move to the next state, which is uh, here's the house that I said I was going to sell you on the contract. And it goes through and, there's a and you, you could get a decline, which is the house is missing things that I said you're going to have. But otherwise, you go through as so you declare it's complete. So what happens is that these are all conversational speech acts that happen. And these are things that we do when we coordinate in organizations, that there are overlapping threads in effect, where people have made commitments or promises based off each other's actions or promises. And so formalizing this, the question that comes out from a language action perspective is why is there a breakdown in organizations? Often it's because the communication doesn't happen, or people have made commitments so that other things are constrained. There are four types of, of, of commitments we have. This is an extension of the work that uh, we have um, from, uh, uh, from Winograd and Flores. So there is a commitment to a deliverable. So pr uh, you produce a deliverable. So on this date, I will bring you a house. On this date, I will deliver this product. There's a type of commitment. There's a commitment to follow a process. If you're going to court, they don't promise you that you're going to win or lose. They promise you're going to follow a process. And that's another type of commitment. A commitment to a capability is one that you provide. So this is a, a commitment to, um, as an example, for a call center. Uh, if someone calls, if, if someone, if you call into a call center and you're on hold for a long time, don't yell at the person answering the phone. They're actually trying to you should follow a process. But the staffing of the facility of call center people is a capability. And so the management had the responsibility to provide that. There's also a commitment to a relationship. We contribute to a relationship. And that is that people will actually allow failures to happen in the deliverables, in the processes, in the capabilities, in the same name of relationship for longer term relationship. 
So those are the things that happen with the language action. And they tie in with uh, the language, the language more specifically, and the action uh, and behavior. So um, there's a range from less intimacy to more intimacy. In the case of less intimacy, you have the accounts of past events where you're doing things together. Uh, in the more intimacy, you share more of what's happening in the future. And that's when you actually get cooperation between people because you have a shared understanding of what's going to happen in the future. On action, you have uh, visible, uniform, undifferentiated action uh, behavior that people see on the outside, as opposed to when you're in uh, the, sorry, the more, more disclosure phase, you have public behavior that's, uh, that's undifferentiated, people can see. Uh, on the less disclosure side, you have particular name negotiated behavior. It happens only you when you negotiate it, you're in the relationship, and only you know what's happening and why those things were done. So we're going to wind down, um, we're going to break down and uh, to this last section, which is the idea of system changes and the question about whether you're, the system changes you're talking about are based off the idea of bias for action or on the idea of the Hippocratic Oath. So bias act for action actually came from Tom Peters um, and, uh, and so it's one of the things that we described in, uh, in Search of Excellence and then looking backwards for it. But in the American approach, this bias action was the first chapter of eight in 1982, and he said that in effect, when you were working organizations, the number one thing that they do, well, let's start with chapter five, number one thing they do is they do something. And so there's this predisposition towards doing something when you're an organization. If you look at physicians that take the Hippocratic Oath, then the question would be, okay, first do no harm, um, and can you make a habit of two things, to help or at least do no harm? This is much closer to the Chinese philosophy, and it works more in a biological sense when you're working with organizations. So, the question that we have, and the discussion point will be, can we deprecate bias for action, which is actually doing something? Is that acceptable in the world we're working in, and saying that we're working on something longer, or can we elevate to doing no harm? Uh, in the case of uh, bias for action, we have the hands assembling the clock. Think about working in a non-living system that you can actually turn it off and turn it back on again. When you are working with a living system, bringing a living system back to life is not a guaranteed thing, and um, it takes time and patience. So, um, we're going to turn now. We'll take uh, another 10 minutes for a break and 10 minutes for discussion, and we'll come back and wrap up after that.